Good morning, all, and welcome to another edition of Wednesday Wake Up. I'm excited and honored to uh, spend this time with you to read through God's Word and to share with you what I think God has placed on my heart uh, for us to take with us out of this passage this week. Um, another thing that popped into my head and woke up at 418 this morning and it popped in my head, so I figure I'll share that with you too, uh, is that my goal in all of these Wednesday wake up sessions, um, something that God popped on my heart maybe two months ago now, uh, my goal is not to make the, the gospel relevant to today's world because it already is relevant. Uh, it's to hopefully highlight how we can tap into it, how we can relieve the dependence that we all have on trying to figure it out for ourselves uh, and instead lean on God, lean on Jesus and his word and, and the direction that he left for us uh, in his word uh, as to how to, how to deal with, with the crazy times that we're in. And, and we're in hard times. And I guess it could be said about any time, but thankfully throughout history, it's not filled with global disease and civil unrest. And that is what we're in the middle of right now. And, and when I spent time with God this week, and tried to ask him, you know, Lord, what is it that we should pull out of this passage that you want us to hear that, that would help in this situation that we're in? Uh, there's one message that came booming out of it of the hundreds that I could probably talk about, and that's what I'm going to share with you today. Uh, so here now a reading of the gospel according to John. This is John chapter 5, verses 1 through 18. And because this passage starts with the words, after this, uh, the this that he's talking about is uh, this passage happens immediately after Jesus heals uh, the official's son. When the official came to Jesus pleading for his son's life, and Jesus healed him immediately uh, from 20 miles away. After this, there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there was a pool called, in Hebrew, Bethzada, which has five porticos. In these, day, in these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and one, while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, stand up, take up your mat, and walk. At once the man was made well, and he took up his mat and began to walk. Now that day was a Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had, who had been cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your mat. But he answered them, the man who made me well said to me, take up your mat and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, take it up and walk. Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had disappeared in the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Do not sin any more, so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it, had, that it was Jesus who had made him well. Therefore, the Jews started persecuting Jesus because he was doing such things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is still working, and I also am working. For this reason, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but was also calling God his own father, thereby making himself equal to God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And so what's happening in, in this passage? In, in context, we are at uh, a place called the Sheep's Gate, and some commentaries uh, say that Jesus chose this location because Jesus himself was described as the Lamb of God. Remember, John the Baptist said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and pointed to Jesus. And so we're at the Sheep's Gate, and, and the focal point here is this pool. Um, it's, it's translated in different ways. It's uh, Bethesda, Bethsaida. Uh, it's, it's House of Mercy, House of Olive. It's it's, it's not as important as the pool itself. It's surrounded by 
uh, five porticos and, and the pool has healing qualities to it. Um, and that's why people gathered around it. And that's the reason for those porticos possibly as well. The porticos are just uh, coverings, um, something that shields you from the, the heat of the sun, but the sides are open so that the breeze can blow through. And these porticos are most likely there to, uh, to organize or to store the different patients that came to the, to the lake for healing. And maybe in one portico, there was uh, folks that were, um, had skin diseases and maybe another portico, ones that were blinded and wanted to put the water onto their faces. And maybe another uh, where they had withered hands and, you know, where the bones and the, and the, and the ligaments um, were not organized correctly. And then when they went into the water, uh, they were healed and strengthened. Um, so this water had healing qualities, and um, some of the translations say that the, when the water is stirred or when the water is troubled, um, so there's something about the water uh, that is being uh, moved, and it's, it's most likely fed by maybe an underground spring or maybe like a mini uh, Old Faithful geyser, if you think of it that way, that the heat builds up on the underground and forces uh, hot water and gases up through the water and it bubbles and it gets stirred and troubled. Uh, and when that happens, um, people go into the water to be healed. Uh, one of the interesting notes that I found in this passage is um, the verse four. So if you're listening to this and you're near a Bible, open up your Bible to John chapter five and read verse four and you probably won't find it because it's not in most of our modern Bibles. But if you look at uh, the King James uh, Bible, we'll read this as verse 4, and it gives a little bit more insight as to what this troubling was all about, this stirring of the water. Verse 4 says, For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. It was probably left out from uh, the later translations because people said, well, that was local superstition at the time. There's nothing fake about angels. And I mean, Jesus talked about angels ascending and descending on the son of man. That's uh, the angels are real. Um, but the fact that the water was stirred up or troubled by an angel coming down and stirring it up uh, may have been more local legend uh, than reality. And so later um, translators chose to leave that out. Um, whether or not that was real, that's something that you can, you can think about in your head. But the important part is that the stirring of the water meant healing. And obviously people came to this pool um, and this one individual, this one paralyzed man that's the subject of this passage, came uh, and was paralyzed for 38 years. And, and I'm not sure if he was there for 38 years or if he was uh, just there for a good portion of his life. But he certainly has patience to wait on the shores of this pool. Uh, waiting for the, the water to be troubled so they can go into it. Now, 38 years uh, in Jesus' time is, is pretty old. Uh, so the fact that this man was still alive at 38, never mind crippled and alive at 38, is pretty amazing. Um, and so here he was on his mat, uh, waiting to go down into the water when it was stirred, uh, waiting to be healed, putting all of his faith in the things of this world, in this case, the pool, now here's what God placed on my heart this week, is the contrast between this healing, because Jesus healed this man. This is his second miracle. Um, Jesus healed this paralytic man. Um, and how that contrasts with his prior healing of the official son. Remember in that passage from last week that we read, this official came to Jesus and, and pleaded for his son's life and, um, and, and said, please, Jesus, heal my son, come to my house 20 miles away and please heal him. And even though Jesus was frustrated with the lack of faith that he saw around, especially even in his hometown, he looked into this man's eyes and he saw belief. He saw that this, this official looked at him and, and believed that he was the son of God, believed that even though he didn't know how Jesus was going to heal his son, that he believed if Jesus wanted to, he could. And Jesus looked into his eyes and said, your son will be better. Your son will be healed. And, and sure enough, with those words alone, even though the son was 20 miles away, Jesus healed his son. 
Now put that in contrast, that faith, that belief in, in, in what, that, um, what that official had in Jesus to this paralytic man in today's story. This man spent the majority of his life, maybe his whole life, struggling to try to get into that pool. And when the healer of the universe came up to him and said, do you want to get better? He didn't say, yes, Jesus, please help me. I have mercy on me. He didn't say any of that. He said, he started complaining about the injustice of the world, about how when the water stirred, everyone cuts in front of him. And, and when he's trying to make his way down, he can't get down there in time and he never gets healed. And that's unfair. And that's he didn't even ask Jesus to, to pick him up and bring him down into the water. He just started griping about the world and the, and the injustice of the world. And yet Jesus healed him too. With the words, he said, get up, pick up your mat and walk. We can imagine that as soon as he said, get up, he probably said it in Aramaic. I don't know what the translation is for get up in Aramaic. But as soon as he said, get up, in that instant, the man was healed. Jesus didn't bless him. He didn't, he didn't anoint him with oil. He didn't place his hands on him. He didn't pray over him. He just said, get up. And with the words, he healed the man completely. Just like God said, let there be light. And there was light. Jesus said, get up. And this man was completely healed. 38 years of being a paralytic went away in an instant in Jesus' words. This man didn't ask for it. This man didn't show any faith. This man, maybe in our eyes, didn't deserve it. And yet Jesus healed him too. And I think that's the message that we need to take away from this, um, from this passage, this, this message of grace. Because think about how far we are from the grace of Jesus, about how our version of justice is so far different from Jesus' version of justice. You see, Jesus heals all. When we look at a situation, we say, well, this person deserves it, and this person doesn't deserve it, or this person has faith, and this person doesn't have faith, and, and they, they should be looked on more favorably by God, and this person shouldn't be looked on more favorably with God. But Jesus doesn't look at it that way. Jesus looks at both and says, you are a precious child of God, and I will heal you you don't even have to acknowledge me. This man didn't acknowledge Jesus for who he was, didn't even care who he was, and Jesus healed him completely. And so when we look at the, at the, the darkness in our world and we start to, to put people in categories and start to say, well, this person deserves it and this person doesn't, Jesus looks at, at the faithful person that, that goes to church and prays for others in the same way that he looks at someone who is looting footlocker and walking out with bags of stolen goods. Jesus heals them both. When, when we look and try to justify what's right and what's wrong, Jesus looks at all of it and says, I love all of you. And so that's a challenge for us. And I don't believe that we can do what Jesus does without help, without asking him for help. I don't believe that we have the ability to, to view the world the way Jesus does without asking to have Jesus in our heart, to understand the world the way he understands the world. We are too broken. We are too filled with sin. The thing that makes us uncomfortable about, about loving the person who kneels on someone's neck until they choke out or, or kneeling or, or, or loving someone who is uh, putting a fireball into a police car and, and trying to love them the same way that we love our own family, the reason why we can't do that is because of the darkness, the sin in our hearts, and because Jesus is not reigning in our hearts. And although it's, it's a lifetime struggle, I would say that that's our challenge, that's our invitation, is to allow him in, in order to understand the world the way he understands the world, the, the grace, the mercy, the peace that he provides, and he can provide it through us if we just let him in. And so I invite you to pray with me right now to, to invite Jesus in so that we can see the world the way he sees the world, so that we can want to heal all in the same way that Jesus heals all. Heavenly Father, we, we sit here humbled at your grace and at your mercy, and we know that we are a broken people that, that can't 
can't do the things that you do, can't see the world the way you do without your help. And Lord, we ask that you, that you come into our hearts, that we welcome you into our world, into our lives, in the same way that we would welcome an old friend. Because you are, Lord, you are our friend. Please give us the eyes to see the world the way you do, the heart to love the world the way you do, and the grace to, to not put up those dividing lines that we so often put up in our world so that we could see your world for the beauty that you've created in it and the beauty that you've created in us and in others. We pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you all. and I look forward to uh, chatting with you again next week.